So now that we've gone over all the SN2, um, SN1, E2, and E1 reactions, now we're going to kind of go over a table to summarize everything. Because uh, it, can, it can get kind of confusing if we know all those facts, but we don't know really how to orient ourselves. Okay, so what I've drawn here is a little table, um, and we, we divide it into nucleophiles or bases, and also in the, in the Y column we have uh, what type of carbon is it. Is it methyl, primary, secondary, or tertiary? Uh, so the first thing we want to do is just understand what um, all these are. So remember tertiary is, for example, if we're looking at this carbon right here, it's going to have three carbon molecules around it. It's going to be attached to three different carbon molecules. Okay? And the secondary is what you guys probably thought of, two carbon molecules, one carbon molecule for primary, and methyl means it's not attached directly to any carbon molecule. So it's just going to be C and probably our, our leaving group, our hydrogen, and also two molecules that aren't carbons. Now we're going to be talking about uh, what all these nucleophiles and what these bases are. So poor nucleophile is stuff like water or an alcohol. Weak bases is something like, um, so weak bases is something like a halogen or NH3. Um, strong bases that are unhindered. Unhindered means that it, it's not very crowded. Um, it's not going to cause a lot of steric hindrance. Are going to be stuff like OH minus, OCH3 minus, NH2 minus. So pretty much we can think of small bases. Okay? And things that are un, uh, that are hindered um, and strong bases are stuff like tert butoxide. So this is our stereotypical um, strong hindered base or LDA. Okay? So those are going to have different properties. Um, so I think the, the best thing is to start on this side uh, with poor nucleophiles. So we remember that um, a poor nucleophile probably rings the bell of SN1 reaction or E1 reaction. Okay? Um, so we're going to see that that's definitely true for secondary uh, and tertiary. Um, but for primary um, and methyl, that's not going to be the case. It's just going to be a no reaction. Uh, because remember, um, the tertiary carbocation is very stable, but a primary is very unstable and very unreactive. Therefore, it's going to be no reaction for those guys up there. Um, for weak base or good nucleophile, remember these are stuff like um, the halogens. Uh, this should ring a bell of SN2. So we see that we have SN2 for methyl through secondary, uh, but for tertiary, it's actually not the case. Uh, remember from before, SN2, um, a tertiary SN2 is probably very unreactive, uh, but a tertiary SN1 or a tertiary carbyl cation is very reactive. So that's why for this one, it's going to be SN1, E1. So this is kind of, um, kind of one of the anomalies that we kind of can remember. I think the best way to remember this table is remember the differences. So in this case, remember these X's and remember in this box, SN1, E1. Okay? The rest should kind of be uh, obvious. Now for strong unhindered base like OH minus, um, NH2 minus, what, we're gonna, what we should kind of remember is E2 um, when we're thinking of bases. But in this case, this is when it gets kind of tricky. So for secondary and tertiary, we're going to have E2, um, definitely. Uh, but for primary and methyl, this is kind of when it, it gets kind of tricky. For primary, we're going to see that it's probably going to be um, SN2. It will also see a mixture of E2 in there. Um, but for methyl, it's definitely SN2. So this one is probably one that we, we wouldn't quite expect. Um, but for the strong hindered, it's exactly what we should expect. So we should see E2 all across the board, except for methyl, which should make sense because you can't have a double bond between a carbon and a nitrogen. Like in this case, a methyl has no uh, two carbon molecules right next to each other. Um, so it would be impossible to have E2 to begin with. So that's why we see SN2 um, at the top right there for the methyl group um, of strong hindered base. All right, so just memorize kind of uh, in the strong unhindered base, we may see a SN2 and also some E2 product as well, uh, but it would kind of be like a mixture. So now we're going to be looking at actual more of the facts behind uh, the difference between SN1 and also the similarities between SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. So we're going to be looking at these four traits right here, rate, reactivity, uh, the nucleophile, and the stereochemistry, because those are probably the most important. So obviously the, the main difference between SN1, SN2, and E1 and E2 is that E1 and E2 forms the alkene, forms a double bond. So we should obviously remember that. Uh, but in terms of rate, so the rates are fairly similar. Okay, So rate for SN1 is K and the electrophile. Um, K is just a constant, and the rate is also just the electrophile. Remember, this is unimolecular, and that's why we only have that one electrophile. 
Um, in biomolecular, in substitution and elimination, we have this electrophile times the base or electrophile times the nucleophile, which are pretty much exactly the same. They're pretty much exactly the same um, in that case as well. So in terms of reactivity, this is when it gets a little bit different. Okay, so remember in SN1, we have tertiary being the best and, and primary being the least reactive, uh, but in SN2, it's flipped. Okay, so here's something that we should remember, the reactivity. But in the reactivity of E1 and E2, they're always tertiary. Is, is the tertiary is always going to be the most reactive and primary is going to be the least reactive. And that's simply because um, tertiary, or, and that's simply because um, secondary alkenes are going to be much more stable than a primary or having no uh, carbon surrounding it. Right? And now in terms of the nucleophile, nucleophile for E1 and SN1 are both going to be poor nucleophiles, so that should be pretty good, pretty easy to remember. But in terms of SN2, um, this is when it's a, a good nucleophile, weak base, versus a strong base in E2. So that's another thing that's different. Now onto stereochemistry, which is probably the most important part, because here's where um, it will really test whether or not you know something or not. Um, in a, in a multiple choice question for the MCAT, you're always going to have the same molecule, but they're going to be inverted in stereochemistry. And that's really wh where they test you, whether or not you really know it. And chances are when you speed through these really quickly, you're going to mess up, if anything, the stereochemistry, not the actual reaction itself. Okay? But know that stereochemistry will still get you the wrong answer, so it's just as important. Um, so we're going to go over those. So stereochemistry for SN1, racemic, because we form that carbocation and it's an sp2 hybridized carbon. Um, there's no preference for R or S, so we're going to have a 50-50 mixture. Versus SN2, which is a backside attack. So we're going to have an inversion of stereochemistry. So if it started as R, now it's going to be converted to S. And now for E1 and E2, um, the stereochemistry... Uh, for E1, it's just going to be trans is more stable. So trans is going to be the one that's going to be the major product. And for E2, it's whatever the stereochemistry that was originally formed for the anti-confirmation. Remember we drew that, that Newman projection that we saw before? Um, something like this. Um, that. So remember when we drew the Newman projection before, uh, we had the H and the CO, so the CO is our leaving group. They have to be anti to, to each other. And so what's going to happen is we're simply going to just keep the orientation that they're in right now. Okay? So we're just going to cut it in half and just draw it the way we see it on the Newman projection. Okay? So it has to be anti and anti determines the stereochemistry.